certainly good to see everybody tonight. Uh, I didn't know what I was supposed to do tonight. I didn't know whether I was supposed to uh, preach. I didn't know how long the program was going to be. And since they gave me 30 minutes, why, I guess I will. <laughs> oh, I know. <laughs> uh, I was really amazed to see how many angels wear tennis shoes. I didn't realize. <laughs> didn't even know they had them back then, but they did. Well, the kids did a wonderful job. And uh, I sure appreciate Linda and uh, Ted. Where'd he go? He's already gone. There he is, way back there, yeah. Really appreciate all the effort they've done. Uh, you know, it's, it's hard work working with kids and getting them ready for something like this. And, and I thought the kids did real good. I thought they really did. You know, uh, this time of year, I, I read something a few days ago, and I'd never stopped to think about it like this, because so many times we talk about the how Christmas has been so commercialized. We're always griping about how commercialized Christmas is. But in this article, this man said, you know, Christmas is a wonderful time of year because the gospel goes out more at Christmas than any other time because of the Christmas carols and people hear about it whether they want to or not and and even though people aren't Christians maybe don't even believe in Christ they do have to stop and realize and are reminded it is the birth of Christ so it is good but the trouble I think I have with Christmas and I think the world has with Christmas is that we think of Christ as an infant a helpless infant and then unfortunately we tend to just leave him there and then people don't think about him then until next Christmas and it's almost like there's a baby and we can take him or leave him and so many times we don't realize who this baby is and we don't realize that he didn't stay a baby he grew up. He became a man. He proved who he was by all the miracles that he worked and by his resurrection. And you can't take him or leave him. You might think you can, but you can't. In the book of Revelation, John the one that Jesus loved. He always never used his name. He always just referred to himself as the one that Jesus loved. John was one that was always right next to Christ. He always wanted to be wherever Jesus was. And in the book of Revelation, he says, I, John, who am also your brother and companion in tribulation, and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in a book and send it into the seven churches which are in Asia. And then he lists these churches. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one likened to the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about with paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. And his feet likened to fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was in the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. Now what we saw depicted here tonight was the Savior's birth. What John saw was the Savior as he comes to judge now, as far as the manger scene, you can celebrate Christmas if you want to. You can honor his birth if you want to. But folks, you're going to meet him at the judgment. You can do what you want to about his birth. 
You can do what you want to about the crucifixion. You can believe what you want to about the resurrection. But we don't have an option about the judgment because he said, for it's once appointed unto man to die and after that, the judgment. Now, those shepherds and those wise men and those kings that came and saw baby Jesus, and I know that he looked like any other little baby, helpless, just an infant, and they went their way and maybe and probably never saw him again. But they worshiped him. But the next time they see him, they will see him as John saw him. As he comes in all of his glory and in his brilliance. And he comes as a consuming fire to judge. Now Jesus was born and he came and offered himself as king of the Jews. And we know that his own people rejected him. And look what he says in Matthew. But he answered into them an evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. But there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. Now, why did he make this statement? Jesus had worked miracle after miracle after miracle. He had fed the multitudes. He had raised the dead. He had healed the blinded eyes. He had stopped the deaf ears. He had healed the lepers. He had done all these things. But they still said, show us a sign from heaven, and then we will believe who you say that you are. But he said, a sinful and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, but no sign shall be given. No more sign except the sign of Jonas. Now, we remember Jonas. We remember that, that the Lord wanted him to go to Nineveh. He didn't want to go to Nineveh. He'd run from the Lord. He was thrown overboard. Uh, he was swallowed by a whale, and he was in the belly of the whale for three days and three nights, and then he was vomited out on dry land, and he decided he'd go to Nineveh. But do you realize that when he went to Nineveh, he probably preached the shortest, shortest sermon that has ever been preached. Nineveh was a great city. The walls were 100 feet tall and 10 feet thick, and it was, I believe, 38 miles around it. They had over 600,000 inhabitants. And it said that he walked a day's journey right into the midst of Nineveh with this great message. And the message was simply this. Forty days and God's going to destroy Nineveh. Boy, that was short, wasn't it? He must not have been a Baptist. <laughs> That's all he said. He just walked in there and said, 40 days and God is going to destroy Nineveh. What happened? The whole city repented. God spared Nineveh. Look what Jesus said. One sign, and that sign is the sign of Jonas. Just as Jonas was in the belly of the whale three days and three nights, I'll be in the heart of the earth three days and three nights, and that's the only sign you're going to get. Now notice this. He says, the men of Nineveh shall rise up in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonas and behold, a greater than Jonas is here. Now, now, now think about this. Here was a Gentile city, never heard the gospel, didn't have the covenants and the prophets that the Jews had. 
Jonas walked into the city, said 40 days, and God's going to overthrow Nineveh. The whole city repented. He came to his own people, worked all these miracles, walked among them, walked on the sea, fed the multitudes, did all those things. And he said, I've been with you all this time. I've preached all these sermons. I've worked all these miracles. You still reject me. And he said, at the judgment, the people of Nineveh shall rise up in judgment against you. And the term rise up meant rise up as a witness. They shall stand and point to that generation as a witness against them. Now notice this, the queen of the south, which was the queen of Sheba, shall rise up in the judgment with this generation and shall condemn it. For she came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, a greater than Solomon is here. You say, well, why are you saying all that and what does this mean anyway? We will be judged according to the light that we have. The Lord says that the servant that knew to do the Father's will and did it not shall be beaten with many stripes. But the servant that knew not the Father's will shall be beaten with few stripes. What am I saying? It's dangerous to hear the gospel. That's exactly what I'm saying. I believe Nineveh also shall rise up in judgment with the United States of America. No country has been blessed like this nation. The gospel is preached every week, in the middle of the week, on TV, on radio, the gospel tracks. We hear it till it's running out our ears and we continue to reject it. Nineveh will rise up in judgment. And I want to tell you the most dangerous place in the world to be is in church where the gospel's being preached if you reject it. Because whether you realize it or not, God is recording your decision. He knows the message that went out. The Holy Spirit deals with the heart, and God records your decision. We celebrate the birth of Christ, and that's wonderful. And we can take it or leave it. We can believe that Jesus was the Son of God or believe that he wasn't the Son of God. We can believe that he lived or didn't live. We can believe the historical facts or not. We can do all those things. But listen, I don't care whether you believe in God or not. You're still going to face him with the judgment. One time, I told this here a while back. A preacher preached on the second coming, and he preached on the rapture. After it was over, a man walked up, and he was very angry and told the preacher, he said, I don't even believe Jesus is coming again. And the preacher said, that's all right. He's not coming for you. You see, it doesn't matter what you believe. There was a virgin-born babe, and his name was Jesus, which means Savior. He did live a sinless life. He went to a cross to pay for my sins and your sins. He rose again for our justification. And guess what? He's coming again. Not as a babe, but as a judge, the Lord of the universe. And the Bible says, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. You know, I used to have a problem with that. They, ooh, that scared me. Every knee's going to bow and every tongue's going to confess. I don't know why that scared me, but it did. It scared me. And then finally I thought, well, what's the problem? I bow my knee now and confess he's Lord. What's going to be the problem then? But the point is this. You may never hear it while you're on earth. Be willing to bow your knee and confess he's Lord. 
But you will on judgment day. But it won't do you any good then. It'll be too late. You do that now. That decision is made now. You accept him as your savior now. And he says today is the day of salvation. Not tomorrow. Not after Christmas. Not the first of the year. He says today is the day of salvation. Why? Because we may not have a tomorrow. Before this surface is over, trumpets might sound. The church is taken out. And you're left behind. Today is the day of salvation. You know, here's what I like about it. And then I'll close with this. I wasn't even going to preach tonight. Didn't know what I was going to preach on until I saw all those tennis shoes. And I thought, well, I'm going to preach on the baby Jesus. He will either be your judge or your defense attorney. Now, when I go to court, I believe I'd rather have him on my side. Don't you? When all authority is given unto him, I believe I would rather have him on my side. If Satan should appear at my judgment, and here's the good news. The good news is he won't be there, all right? But my wife will. That's <laughs> and she'll be pointing finger at me. I remember when you bought me some light bulbs for Christmas. I never will forget. <laughs> Actually, I didn't do that. She bought them. But do you know that at the judgment, if I do have an accuser, he's going to be my defense attorney? And did you know if Satan could stand there and list every evil thing that I ever did, said, or thought, Jesus, the advocate, would say, yes, Father, but I paid for it. He'd say, behold, the nail prints in my hands and my feet, the scars on my head, the stripes on my back, and the wound in my side. Every sin that he paid for or died or committed, I paid for. Isn't that wonderful? That's wonderful. I'll tell you what, when John saw him, he fell as dead. The very sight and the glory of him, he fell as dead. Listen, I don't want him on the other side of the bench from me. I want him as my defense attorney. And do you realize this? The father always gives the son anything he asks for. And the father and the son Ask the Father to set me free. That's comforting. Isn't it? So if you know Jesus as your Savior, Christmas has a special meaning. This isn't the end, this is the beginning. All this means is that the Savior was born. But as Paul Harvey says, in a little bit, the rest of the story, read the rest of it. And you get the rest of the story. You will find that he grew up. He went to the old rugged cross. He died. He rose again. He ascended. He's coming back. And he's going to be our judge. But I would a lot rather be at the judgment bar of Christ than the great white throne of judgment. Have a merry Christmas. <laughs> I hear somebody say, oh, yeah, right. <laughs> Well, you can. If you know Jesus, you have the reason to celebrate. What a wonderful Christmas present the Father gave us when he gave us Jesus. The judge of heaven and earth wants to be your friend. He wants to find a place in your heart. They named him Jesus, Savior, and he wants to be
We thank you for coming. We ask every one of you to 